Hajime gets his revenge and saves his classmates again. What you missed from Adi Fritz's best episode. This is season two finale, like kind of recap, but also goes into the more backstory of that girl, Eri. I'm an anime only, so I don't get, I don't know who the fuck this Eri girl is, but apparently she has, she's more than just being down bad and horny for Koki. Let's see what Anyus has to say. It's not very often that we get an episode as thrilling as this one, but it's when we do that I'm reminded of how good this show could have been. In season one, it was. <laughs> How good this show could have been is pretty much how I feel like whenever I watch Andy's videos and he shows me the fucking manga panels, I'm like, God damn, so much missed potential. The arrival of Hajime in episode 12, and in season 2, it was this most recent okay. one here. That was pretty hard. Wait, way he caught fucking Mel's blade, this is really cool. To this, it was this, this, this is one of the coolest ones. And then Mel says, please, kill me. And then Hajime's like, okay, bang. Well, compared to Koki before, he asked Koki the same thing. He was like, please kill me, and Koki was like... I can't! Giga Chat Hajime. Most recent one here. There's just something extremely satisfying in watching Hajime make everyone else's this problems bitch. seem so trivial. I never thought I'd get to see a moment like that again, yet here we are with one that I'd say surpasses it. Especially when you that see just how brutal Hajime really was. So, even if this season wasn't that much better than the first, the payoff of this season wasn't that much better than the first. <sighs> was season 2 better than... Honestly... I don't even know. I feel like Adi Fureta, most of the times, I'm just waiting for these episodes, right? The episodes that I really like are either just like random slice of life episodes where we're just fucking around with the group. Like there's like a lot of like Papa Ajme moments with Miu and like fun moments where like, I don't know, uh, like uh, what's, what's your name? Yui is like saying perish, you know, Th those kind of moments are more fun to me than fighting random SGI monsters. And then there are moments like this when we actually do save the class, the human interactions, right? That I really look forward to. Those are the best episodes. This single episode it definitely made the whole journey worth it. Yeah. So let's take a look at- I feel like I'm just waiting for this episode the entire season, right? And same thing with season one. Like, the entirety of season one, you guys could hear me kind of like bitching about the labyrinth, right? Because I just wanted to get back to the classroom. I just wanted to get everyone else's reaction as to how Hajime has transformed, but it is what it is. Look at how one of the best episodes of Arifodato went to the novels. That was crazy. <laughs> this motherfucker, he baited. I can't believe it fell for that because he came here trying to save Cody and then it wasn't actually that. But first, this video is sponsored by Manscaped. Oh, Manscaped commercial? One of these days, I'm gonna get a fucking sponsor to guys. Hashtag caca for Manscaped. All right. 20% off. Yeah, but yeah, now, yeah. Let's get back to the video. Here we go. Starting things off at the end of episode 10. It was Shizuku's years of training and experience combined with her impeccable senses that allowed her to fight back despite being blinded. Mm. She was the only one who could block the backstab that nobody else saw coming. As for everyone else, not only were they incapacitated- Wait, so when this got blinded, it was her impeccable senses. I thought it was just because she went like this and she actually managed to cover her eyes. I th like, well, everyone else just got blindfolded immediately. That nobody else saw coming. As for Wait, everyone else, right, years on. of training and experience combined with her impeccable senses that allowed her to fight back despite being blinded. She was the only one who could block the backstab that nobody else saw coming. As for one second, guys, sorry. Ooh, ooh. Everyone else, not only were they incapacitated to the point of not being able to move, but every single one were cuffed with mana sealing shackles. That wasn't restraints explained. that made it impossible for any single person to activate any sort of healing. Out of all the classmates who'd been stabbed, though, there was one in particular who had gotten it worse than all the others. You see, Kaori. because Kosuke was the most adept at stealth, the knights made sure to stab every limb of his body. What? So, in addition to a sword sticking. They did not. Well, they showed that, but I didn't realize that's fucked up. This is the guy that was like running and trying to like send messages up before. Wow, that's fucked up. Back, there were also four others for each of his arms and legs. <laughs> now, the reason Shizuku was taken down herself was mostly due to Nia's deception. She got stabbed. But the way it happened in the novels was slightly different. Unlike how Nia had just run up to her in the anime, Eri had made it look as if Nia was about to be stabbed herself. What? She was lying on the ground struggling to fight off a knight who looked as if he was about to kill her. Oh, so when Nia called for I see, I see. Help, it was only natural that she rush over and put herself right between them, thus giving Nia the opportunity to stab her in the back. When Eri had come out to reveal her whole master plan next, there <laughs> was a few fuck interesting she, man? details left out that made her accomplishments even more impressive. Okay. The first was the initial step of using Catalea to send a message. Back when Hajime had killed her in the labyrinth, 
Eri had stayed behind to revive her corpse and send her back to the demons. Wait, what? It was the only way she could get in touch with them without risking her own. Eri had stayed behind to revive her corpse and. What do you, what do you, what do you, what do you mean revive her corpse? So like, the the demon girl is alive. The girl that we killed in season one is alive. Revive the corpse. The necrom. Oh, I see. Okay, she's actually a zombie form. Okay. What? So, does, does, doesn't that mean that um, the demon people here will be really upset that you're keeping my wife as like an undead? Like, I, I don't know how the blonde guy would feel about that. I, 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 does he even know about that? And sent her back to the demons. It was the only way she could get in touch with them without risking her own life. It was also how the demons had come to know of Hajime's existence. Okay. So, once the demons had received her invitation for cooperation, they were able to respond back by sending their own reanimated corpse. But because a demon corpse wouldn't have been able to make it past the kingdom's barriers, the demons were instead forced to send a human corpse. This was how the two would stay in contact and set up their schemes together. Okay, that scene was fucking crazy. Okay, uh, do you guys remember this exact moment? Do you guys ex do you remember corpse. this exact moment? This was how the two would... Like, there is one fucking frame where Eri is on the ground. Freed is riding a dragon, right? They look at each other. And then the next frame, she's on top of the dragon. Like, how the fuck? I mean, it, I guess it could be explained that Freed, like, swooped down on the dragon and picked Eri up and ran away. But when I saw that, and I'm like, how is Eri going to get away? Like, at that moment on the ground level, there's no way Eri could go away, get away. She gets away. Now, does this really matter at the end of the day? Not really. Freed must have used spatial magic teleport. <laughs> okay, what we need. Okay, okay. I understand that this is viable, right? I understand that this could be possible. But when we have to go this far to make a reach to justify what could have happened by saying, you know, oh, Freed used spatial magic in that second, one fucking fraction of a second that we saw in the anime to happen. I don't know, man. I feel like. I feel like we're just in complete bullshit territory. It doesn't matter. It really doesn't. But when I saw that, I was just like bewildered. I was just baffled. Just straight up just in shock. How the fuck did she get away? Would stay in contact and set up their schemes together. What made Eri's scheme so particularly terrifying, though, was the unique spell that she had developed just to make it happen. Necromancy. You see, spirit binding was a level of necromancy that no one even thought to be possible. The extent to which a skilled practitioner could use the dead was at most mindless servitude. All right, guy. Eri versus Ainz. I, I need a power scaling. I need a power scaling comment in the comment section. Eri versus Ainz. Who wins? Through very basic commands. So for an undead corpse to hold a conversation or even display any sort of personality, well, that was a groundbreaking feat completely unique to huh. Eri. In fact, the way she was able to interfere with the victim's soul directly was so OP that you could almost classify it as ancient magic. What? Her ability to rip memories and personality. Okay, and her power right now is just straight up no special bullshit. She, this is just the power that she got, right? As soon as she arrived here. And there's nothing extra that she got, right? This is straight up just her kind of like base powers, right? No, no, no crazy power ups, but she has like ancient magic tier powers. He then copied them to That's a crazy. was nothing short of an inferior version of it. She was very clearly a genius at the job class that was gifted to her. That's kind of crazy. One key distinction that does need to be made, though, is that the king and the nobles aren't under the same influence that the army is. Oh? Yes, they are being controlled much like how these knights are, but that's more due to Noint's brainwashing than it is to Ares' necromancy. Didn't know May Noint could also do brainwashing. And now, and maybe this is like spoilers for season 3 content, but does this imply that Kaori can now brainwash because she has Noint's body? Like, I'm trying to... Does Kao Is Kaori still a priest? You know? Or does she have all the Valkyrie powers of Anoint? Like, how, how, how does that work? Maybe that's spoiler for season 3? So, I do believe that most of the important people in the kingdom are still alive now. The <laughs> wait, 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 what is this? <laughs> Lil JK, they're dead. <laughs> wait, what did he just say? I believe that most of the important people in the kingdom are still alive now. <laughs> nah, they're dead. So, like, Ishtar, this is the head pope, right? King, everyone is dead. Like, this kingdom? Who's left in the kingdom? There's just like random ass soldiers and it's Princess Lily, right? That's it. All these boomers, they all just dead. So it's like, this kingdom is empty as fuck now. now the fact that Eri was able to cooperate with Noint, though, had led her to believe her actions were ordained by God. She truly believed that heaven itself was her ally. I mean, if you get, if you get necromancy powers, that kind of insane. That, I mean, you, you would feel like a god too. Everyone else thinks she was completely crazy. 
Now, it was as Eri stepped forward to take care of Shizuku that Koki would struggle with all his might to activate Overload. He had actually managed to crack several of the five restraints that were currently oh? limiting him. Oh, okay. But because the undead knights holding him were far stronger than their living versions, he was simply too overwhelmed to. Nah. Okay, Anonymous is probably right. There's many justified reasons as to why Koki was down like this, but goddamn, Hatsumi made like a very funny comment at the at, at this episode. I think he said something along the lines of, "Why is it that I don't think he says the season finale, but why why is it that when things matter, you're always on the fucking ground?" It's so true. He was like this in season one too. Koki's always on the fucking ground, not being able to do anything, bro. Break free from them. So just like how we saw in the anime. It was none other than Kaori who would conveniently arrive to save her. The events of which were pretty much this the same crazy. up until- This is crazy. This is crazy because I almost gave him the benefit of doubt here. Conveniently arrived to save her. This moment? I thought, because like before the backstab, he kind of saves Kaori, right? But that's to like kind of like gain her trust for like that 10 seconds. So I was like, oh shit, wait, is he about to get a redemption arc? Is he feeling bad that he's going to help us out right now? And I'm like immediately backstab again, dude. Events of which were pretty much the same up This is a double backstab too. For a bit more context on what Kaiori was thinking, though. Well, this was her doing her very best to show her devotion to Hajime. If she truly wanted to consider herself a member of his party, then she knew that the least she could do was follow in his footsteps and fight to the end. Hmm. It didn't matter how tough or unwinnable the situation became, because Hajime was the type of person who would always push straight through it. And those were the ideals that Kaiori wanted to live up to. So, with a resolve that couldn't be shattered by anyone, Kaiori would use her last seconds to cast a final spell that would heal everyone. Actually, massive respect to Kaori at this moment. This is the point where I no longer thought Kaori as like a joke, and it's like because she stabbed here. She can't fucking speak, but she's still finishing off her spell. Even though she's stabbed and she's about to die, she gets double stabbed and she's still finishing the spell. I'm like, you know what? Massive respect to Kaori there. Seconds to cast a final spell that would heal everyone. That was huge. That actually huge. As well. This panel right here, that was actually really good. This panel, when you see when you see, when you saw this, I'm like, oh, oh, people are gonna die. Hajime is pissed. This was a this is a great panel. But the fatal nature of the wound combined with Haima's continuous song motion back and forth completely prevented the light from repairing such severe damage fast enough. Absolutely nothing was going to stop Haima from killing the this, this fucking guy, dude. With the this spell fucking having guy. Been completed, though. It was only a matter of time before Koki and many of the other students would break free from their shackles. Even Eri knew her puppet plan was futile now. That said, her overwhelming numbers still meant that she had the advantage. Until see, because many of the students <laughs> until Hasmi brings out a Gatling gun weren't veterans in combat like how Koki's party was. There was a whole separate group of them that needed to be protected. I call these like the farm group because like I remember a couple in from the farm episode I don't think this I don't I don't think this the one two three actually these are from the farm group maybe this one and this one is I forget students too scared to fight her they're just jobbers so with Jugo and Ryutaro taking most of the aggro I gonna lie I don't know who the fuck Jugo is but Ryutaro is like the monk guy right the monk class it was Yuta and a few others who would attack whenever I should know these people's names but I don't I don't know their names dude I'm terrible <laughs> is Yuka the one that was thankful to, um... Yeah, and, okay, by the way, Progamster, you're the one calling Kaori Loudy right here, not me, no, no, no. I got you on stream, you're the one that called her Loudy. But is Yuka the one that is, like, uh, the one that was very appreciative and thankful to Hajime? And was the one that was, like, talking to Hajime in Season 1? Never possible. As for Koki and Shizuku, both were going wild in their attempt to okay. get to Kaori. Okay, okay. Normally, Shizuku would have been able to do so pretty easily, but the trauma of seeing her best friend die right before her eyes had made her far too distraught to fight effectively. It was a downward spiral of emotion that made her combat in Even fun. here! Koki deft her e e Wait, 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 even here! Because, like, okay, okay, <laughs> little, little break, okay? Little, little break, guys. Just, just give me a second here. I, I want you guys to see this, okay? I want, I, because I'm not crazy, and I'm, this is ex extra proof now, okay? Look at this. Look at the thumbnail of the last video, okay? Look at this one right here. Do you see this? Do you see this? Her left titty is slightly bigger than the right titty here. And I'm not crazy, okay? And I can prove it because right here, look. Look, even here. Even in this frame. So now I'm being led to believe that the animators are intentionally doing this with consistency to tell us something. This is not a mistake. Look. Left side is clearly more surface area than the right side. It's not the angles. No, this is two different cases. Okay, guys? 
Guys, this is a repeating behavior. It was a downward spiral of emotion that made her combat increasingly sloppy. Koki definitely could have done so pretty easily as well, but the presence of Meld made any progress practically impossible. Yes, he did understand that Meld was already dead, but that certainly didn't Too much respect for Meld. Painful. Everything about it just went to play on his greatest weaknesses. All Meld had to say was, please don't kill me, and just like that, Koki could no longer rule out the possibility of him still being alive. Those few words was all it took for Koki to think that Meld could still be saved by him. Man, Despite I don't blame Koki either. That he was dead only moments ago. Koki was just too easily swayed by his own emotions. I don't even blame Koki here. Because like, I, I, I do shit on Koki here and there, right? I do shit on him a lot. But like at that moment, I have a lot of respect for Mel too. I think I, I couldn't have done it. But Hazme just straight up shows up. Okay, done. Bang. Zero hesitation. But he does say... That's a, it's a bit of a waste, right? This is a regret that Meld was wanting to die there. He could never bring himself to make that crucial decision when the situation really called for it. And oh, he did that too! Because he saw the frame he could of the lover! Oh my never god! Bring himself to I forgot! He fucking stopped in season one as well. He couldn't do it! Make that crucial decision. This fucking guy! The situation really called for it. And you know what? Ah! Yeah, I guess he's, he's, he's like a righteous knight, you know? He's a self-insert white knight. He's just full of justice. I don't blame him for not being able to kill Meld. Like, if I was in Koki's position, I couldn't either. I respect Meld way too much, but Hajime don't give a fuck. That was the biggest difference between him and Hajime. Unlike Hajime's ability to do what was necessary, yeah. Koki was always restructuring his priorities based on whatever new information became available to him. He was constantly trying to interpret things in the way that was most convenient. Koki's actually... Like, as much as I shit on him, he's a very, mm, may maybe relatable, if, if you ignore the self-insert night parts. I don't know, he has a lot of these, like, different, like, hesitations and, like, weaknesses. Even though he is supposed to be, like, a hero, in these crucial moments, he just hesitates. He does, he just chokes, man. He always chokes. Often making him unable to see things for the way they really were. Thus, the reason for him falling short all the time. So, with him <laughs> falling short, he fell. He falls, get it? He's in the ground. Capacitated and Shizuku being too far to help, Eri would begin the chant to turn Kaiori into her puppet, leading us to the moment I'm sure we were all very eagerly anticipating. Mm -hmm. The hero arrives late. Really... Kaiori's soul was about to be desecrated that an ominous voice would halt absolutely everything. Oh, yeah. Even time itself appeared frozen while in the presence of this terrifying pressure. Another thing. Any news just said before Kaori's soul was to be desecrated because you know we got the the uh, spirit binding or whatnot right from from uh, from Eddie right she can do like she can control the soul and make them into zombies. Now we also have ancient magic though that was able to implant souls into different bodies. I'm not sure if implanting is the extent of what we can do with soul manipulation with you know the ancient magic, but couldn't we technically use that ancient magic and reverse? The zombification, necromancy, is that possible? I don't know, I'm just throwing out theories because he just mentioned, you know, the whole necromancy thing is, you know, distorting the soul. We technically have, you know, soul manipulation too, right? It was such a powerful aura of intimidation. <laughs> this is for Tio right here. And that the instinctive fear of the had caused Ares soldiers to form a circle around her. Only the fear of death was being transmitted to them now. So, with everything currently at a standstill, a few moments was all it took for Hajime to realize that Kaori's heart wasn't beating. A revelation that turned his expression into one so terrifying that the only thing anyone could imagine was the horrific death awaiting them. And him. His hostile intent had such an overwhelming grasp on everyone that it felt like he could kill them all with just the snap of his fingers. That's the level of anger that Hajime was currently displaying here. Then, and only a second later, Hajime had already sent Hayama flying to the opposite end of the court. <laughs> he just one punched them so not easily. Only crushed most of his internal organs, but also <laughs> shattered close to every bone in his body. Oh, really? The only reason he didn't die instantaneously was simply because Hajime decided to pull his punch a bit. He had held himself back out of consideration for Kaiori. What? <laughs> So even after he backstabbed Kaori like twice and she's about to be turned to a zombie, he still goes easy out of considerations for Kaori. That's insane. That's insane. But anyways, I like to think more of, you know, we can't kill him just yet. And I think it's even more disrespectful that we didn't kill him. We shattered all his bones in his body to show some level of mercy, but then we just tossed him out, right? We just fucking throw him out of the kingdom so that he can just get trampled by the demons. I think that's a very fitting disrespectful death right if we had killed him if we executed him with the gun i feel like that's 
too good for someone as piece of shit like Daisuke, you know? I just want him to just get stepped on by like demons. That was actually quite um, deserving. Not because he thought that she wouldn't approve, but instead because he didn't want his hasty actions to injure her further. Uh, as okay. for Hayama, well, let's just say he probably wished he was dead. The pain from the impact was one so great that it wouldn't even allow him to be unconscious through it. He could only stay put and wallow in sheer and utter agony. When Hashime <laughs> that animation is hilarious. Next, much of the interaction was pretty much the same. Where the anime starts to differ, though, is the method that Hashime oh. had used to dispatch <laughs> Bang! Kondo. You see, instead of just using Donner to shoot them in the face, Hashime instead opted to use his elbow shotgun, one of the many weapons implanted into his arm that allows him to strike Rocket punch. trying to flank behind him. So, with only a couple barrages of pellets, both the obstacles standing in Hajime's way were taken care of. <laughs> he doesn't even was actually- I kept like, I knew Hajime could do it, but he was so nonchalant, he just fucking- Mel just like attacks, Hajime's like, shing, blade catch, and then Mel's like, please, kill me. And where- that's the part where Koki will be like, no, I can't, Mel! Hajime's like, okay. Obstacles standing in Hajime's Bang. way were taken care of. Zero hesitation! Eri did hope that Hajime's connection to Melt would cause him to hesitate, but Hajime was nowhere Me near too. as attached to him as Koki was. Is there no way that Mel came back? But, like, the more I think about it, the more I think about it, and how, like, the arc after this is now we're going to, like, because now it is a revelation that beyond this kingdom, there's an actual, like, emperor. Because I thought that this kingdom was, like, the main place. This is like the capital. It's not. It's just one single kingdom. Well, I guess like it is the capital, but there's like a bigger nation, you know? The, 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 the world building, the scaling of it just got bigger as they announced, oh, we're going to go to the emperor now. I'm like, wait, the fuck? And now I'm realizing Mel doesn't need to exist anymore because we're going away from this current kingdom. He's served his purpose. There's no need for anyone to exist in this kingdom anymore, to be honest. It's just a forgotten land now, and we're going to go somewhere else. Which is really sad. I, I wanted Meld back, man. I wanted Meld back. Yes, Meld was one of the few adults he was known to trust, but that didn't change the fact that he was now an enemy. Now, if you're wondering why Hajime didn't just kill Eri right away, well, that's because she wasn't just your normal enemy. Eri what? had done something unforgivable. She had hurt someone that was very important. Torture to her. her! So, if he was to kill her like he would any other enemy, then that just wouldn't be enough for him. Torture her! Hajime wanted Eri to suffer more. Yes. He wanted her to truly taste despair first. Yes. That's why he decided to ask her that single question. He didn't care about the details or why she did it, but instead asked so just to show her there was nothing she could do about it. Oh. He wanted her to realize that everything she'd done was useless. I didn't, didn't even realize that. I didn't realize the significance of that line. No matter how much work she'd put in or how much control she'd previously had, because in the presence of Hajime it all amounted to nothing. That's what Hajime wanted Eri to realize here. Oh. He was forcing her to understand just how futile all her efforts were. Of course, the revelation of such unfairness had spurred a growing hatred towards Hajime, but as soon as the barrel of Donner pointed towards her head, the only thing she could think of was how she was going to die. And she certainly would have if not for the only well-animated scene I think I've ever seen. Freed showing up? Anime. Oh? Damn! I forgot. You know what? That last interaction with Dice, this is the one thing he was good for. An actual great animated scene. Let's watch that again. I forgot all about the. Oh my god. This was crisp. Still not even looking at him. Oh. The way they did this the fucking tosses him afterwards. Counter, then Hayama's scream actually yeah. made me feel like I was watching a different anime for a second. <laughs> An actual anime. There was some genuine quality to be found in this brief sequence of Even events. the blood right here, you know? What the anime failed to portray, though, was the pathetic nature of Hayama's counterattack, along with the savage display of brutality to come right after. Oh? You see, Hayama wasn't do? nearly as capable as the anime made him seem here. His right shoulder was dangling limply from being shattered, and his charge could barely even be identified as running. He simply had sword in hand, doing whatever he could to make his way to Hajime. He looked way the cool in the anime, okay. Him once he got there, though, was an immediate foot to the face, followed by an axe kick downward. Not even Hajime worth our wasted time. no time slamming Hayama's skull straight to the ground. Not only cracking the floor where his head made impact, but finally putting him to sleep from the excessive force of it. Ah, oh, wait, doesn't this imply that when we throw him out then, that he's like, no, no, maybe he's waking up by the time we throw him out, but this could imply that he was asleep, so he didn't feel any of the pain getting stomped down by the, the demons outside. Even after all that abuse, though. Hayama still clung to whatever little life remained of him. 
Good, and good. you best believe that Hajime made sure to make him regret it. As soon as Hayama's head bounced back from that initial Toss impact, him outside. Hajime kicked it again to send him flying upward. This Wake time up. holding back to make sure Hayama would regain consciousness instead of... Okay, good, 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 good. only after grabbing him by his collar on the way down, do we finally get to the point of Hajime lecturing him in the anime. So, aside from the whole talk about Hayama being the only person to blame, Hajime also went on to roast his entire existence. He was going... Let's see. You didn't lose to other people. You lost to yourself. Yeah, he was too damn bad to coward. He did lose himself. Hell would have to freeze over before you'd manage to do anything worthwhile with your miserable existence. He couldn't even do this right, bro. Like, straight up. Hayama couldn't even, like, the back, like, the, the whole setup here, the whole betrayal, he couldn't even do that shit correctly. So went on to roast his entire existence. He was going out of his way to make Hayama's death as painful as possible. Not because he had pushed him into the abyss all those months ago, but instead because he had tried to kill Kaori. Yeah. He was actually impressed at how low Hayama would go to achieve so little. So, after all was said and done, Hashime punched Hayama with enough power to send him spinning, then kicked him with so much force that you could hear the crunching of every bone his foot made contact with. But just like before, he had unconsciously held back just enough to keep Hayama alive. Yes, because he needs to get stepped on. He wasn't sure why he did, but it was clear that he wanted the demons to be the ones to rip him apart. Yes! It was the least he could do to get vengeance for Kyori. And in my head cannon, in my head cannon, after the demons stepped on him outside, he was still alive. Barely, just like 1% HP left. And then that's when the satellite laser beam executes. That's how I... Maybe that'd be too good of a death for him. I don't know. I don't know. Maybe from feet up, you know? The laser starts from the feet up and then slowly goes to his head. So he has to endure all that pain. I, I hope something like that. He may not have been fully aware of it himself, but everything Hashime had done here just went to show how much he cared for her. This whole savage display of brutality was actually him just expressing his compassion for her. Now, once Freed had made his appearance shortly <laughs> after... This is the funniest shit. Mis this is the funniest shit, because Freed straight up ran away after fighting Yue. He just lost to Yue and runs away. Straight up some League of Legends teleport back to the base and come back. And as soon as he comes back, he leaves again. Like, what? Conception that seemed to be <laughs> you coward! Actions. And that was the idea that Hajime was fighting for the sake of the kingdom. So, no, in order we to weren't. To take advantage of that, he had used his teleportation magic to bring all the monsters here, then was going to force Hajime into a corner by using the other students as hostages. It was his final push for victory since he knew he couldn't beat Hajime head on. Especially since Yue had left him in a state where he couldn't even fight anymore. Oh, he what couldn't Hajime fight, okay. His plan seemed trivial, though, was put to use a prototype what is this? called Hyperion. Hyperion. Okay, finally we're getting an explanation as to what this satellite laser beam is. It's a prototype weapon? An artificial satellite that focused sunlight, then enchanted it with gravity magic to fire it like a laser. Sunlight amplified with gravity magic. O okay. It's not like he needed it to win against a million monsters, but it was more so just because he just didn't flex. have time to. He just flexed. That's why he didn't kill Freed here as well. If he did, then a massive disorganized mob of monsters would get in the way of him saving Kyori. So, it was after Freed had used- mm, I feel like we got different monsters that could have taken out the CJ monsters. I feel like we could have killed Freed there, but if we killed Freed, like, clearly these guys have extra plot for Season 3 content. The author can't just kill them off, right? So, so logically, what any new saying is probably correct, but, you know, plot reasons I think is better. teleportation magic to save Eri that he would reluctantly leave with the rest of his armies. There was no way he was going to risk being attacked by something so powerful again. But, yeah. That's pretty much how this episode had gone in the novel. Best episode. I wasn't even planning to do a cut content for it, but this episode was just too hype for me not to. Yes. It reminded me of why I enjoyed Arifodeta so much in the first place. Let just me to know flex. what you think down in the comments, though. I'm I curious agree. to see if you were even able to make it to this episode. Of course. Of course, and I think a lot of people might have dropped Arifodeta back in the day, but give, uh, give any news a like, you know, subscribe to the channel if you haven't. Definitely, this is my favorite episode from Ari Furuta. Like, the whole reason I watched this show for, straight up from episode zero was for the character interactions of how they would, like, as soon as Hajime became a Giga Chad, how would everyone else start, like, bully them and respond? That's all I gave a shit about. The CJ monsters, the labyrinth stuff, really not really my, you know, the most interesting part of the content, but you gotta get it done because the Liberators, there's actual, like, there is plot there. There's valuable plot there. You need to know about the ancient magic and about how the past and God of Heat and the Mavericks and the Liberators and all that shit. And we got to collect the waifus along the way, but still fantastic anime. Season three, who knows when that's going to be, but I'll be watching that. I'll be watching that.